It was actually interviewing, it was a store launch. We were wanting some managerial presence and it was a petrol station in particular. And there was some gaps in this guy's CV. Started probing, it's only been at his ma- uh, Her Majesty's pleasure for a couple of years. All right, well, uh, rehabilitation under the Offenders Act. Do you feel comfortable in telling me, you know, why you got sent to prison? I said, yes, yeah. actually uh, was involved in an armed robbery. I, I went, oh, right. Right. This is on a petrol station. What do you do there? Hey guys, Matt Haycox here, and welcome to another episode of the HR Zone. Got Kelly with me, as usual. So, as usual, we're on episode three of this. Over the last couple of weeks, we have talked about, well, we've set the scene. We've talked about our HR journey and the fact that it's my big 2023 mission to get better at culture, to get better at HR, and that's why Kelly joined us. Last week, or last episode, we talked about recruitment and how to recruit and how specifically to try and recruit without using those pesky, expensive recruitment agents. So this week we're going to be talking all about interviewing. I guess it's uh, the right chronological order of what to do and Kelly and I are interviewing or talking about interviewing on a weekly basis, almost a daily basis for Kelly at the moment because we're very, very aggressively staffing up in the, in all different areas. So um, I guess uh, this will be, this is almost like, um, what, what's the word, a, a, a review of Kelly's work as well so I can, I can, I can see how she's doing with her interviewing. But uh, no, that's what we're going to be talking about. I mean, I've always been probably, I'd say, a pretty poor interview viewer be you know in, interested to uh, get any comments from any of you guys listening to this and uh, you know understand how you guys do your interviews I mean I've always come from a, a very simplistic basic perspective of uh, the fact that unless someone's utterly dreadful they're going to tell you what they want to hear in an interview and how many times can you interview them how many questions can you ask them you just have to kind of bite the bullet and go with your gut but that has also ended up with me hating 99.9% of the people that I've ever worked with so uh, maybe maybe my uh, interview techniques aren't the best so Kelly, where am I going wrong and what do we need to know? Wow. <laughs> I'm just sort of calculating your percentages there. Um, so I, I suppose um, for all businesses, they do rely on, they haven't got an HR function, some do, but you know, when you're relying on maybe recruiters or external bodies, it can quickly go wrong and you could end up with people who just aren't the right fit for your organisation. I suppose starting off, people think, well, why would I interview? Why do I need to? Well, the purpose of the interview is to gauge that person's experience. It gives you a chance to assess their ability, you know, measure their aptitude as well. And, you know, personality comes into it. And for for some, they may think, well, you can't just pick people you like. But there's lots of facets to that, isn't there? Because, you know, they've got to be able to gel with the team. You've got to see the bigger picture. You know, what can they bring to the team? You're trying to build a, a super team and you need somebody with every every single quality, um, you know, not one person has all that. Have you already been able to identify a lot of these traits and characteristics before you even do the interview at first? Like, I mean, like, do you have a do you have a good idea that that person has got the bare bones of what it takes to fit into your into your team into your company culture, or do you not really get to find any of this out until that first interview? Well, do you know what? That that's it's a really funny question, and if people have done interviews, they're probably thinking, where uh, where do you go with that one? And uh, I suppose you do think on paper anybody can put anything down and sometimes the person that appears in front of you you almost have to check whether the paper matches the person in front you know some people absolutely bomb at interviews and that's where a great interviewer comes in isn't it if you've done a really good heavy sit and you've got a clear identification of what type of person you need, you're halfway there. I think when interviewers get it wrong is when they're going in, they haven't put the time and effort in to understand what they want out of the role. So... You, you talk about gut instinct and, and invariably everybody goes from a gut instinct but actually is a gut instinct getting you the right person I know it's not lawful is it fair are you prone to bias and we can touch upon that in a bit so I think the the, the why is actually the, there's a lot of good reasons why we do the interview 
T- talk about for a minute. You say what's not lawful because uh, that, that's that, that's that's an interesting. But I mean, I, I don't I don't know the answer. I, mean, I hear the the kind of the rumours or the or, or or the kind of anecdotal myths or whatever of, of what what you're not supposed to ask. But and, and I'm sure I break all of those rules anyway. But what I mean, what 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 can you not ask in England? Well, what you've got to make sure of is you've got a fair criteria. Are you asking every if you've got five interviews that day? Have you got some clear guidelines and are you asking all five people the same questions roughly and um, because you know somebody comes in and I don't know you're a Newcastle United fan if they suddenly say oh well I support that you develop this common ground you know people you know if there's anything that links people they immediately become biased pro-biased towards them and you develop this like it's just a natural trait and um, if somebody was there talking to you about I don't know, the solar system, that might not be your bag and you just switch off. Absolutely switch off and you don't give that person sort of a mark goes against them. I'm less. I'm less asking about, let's say, bias, and more like, for example, I, I'm. I, I think I've been told, you know, you can't ask, you know, if someone's got kids or if someone wants kids mm. or. And like, I, I know, you know I'm, I'm setting myself up for a for a tribunal here, but you know, I'm sure, you know, you, you'll you'll know from your interview. I mean, I, I just, mm. yeah, it's not particularly a, a leading question, you know. For me, I just like to ask some things to develop a rapport. And I'll always say, you know, well, what what's your setup at home? Have you got a mister? You got a missus? You got kids? You know, what what, what you're up to? Yeah. I mean, are you, you, even you, that, you're not supposed yeah, to be I doing mean, that. absolutely not. I mean, you know what? Even that, you just immediately classified somebody by a stereotypical viewpoint. So, um, you know, naturally, some people would often, if, if there's a woman there, oh, have you got a husband at home? Well, actually, why can't they have a wife? Why can't they have a partner? You know, and, you know, I've been asked many, many times, what about your children? Well, actually, it's, it's unlawful to ask that because, you know, it can lead and we know it happens. To me, whether you've got a child or haven't got a child, I'm not employing you for that. I'm employing the best person for the job. So by all means, absolutely lead, you know, lots of open questions. And if the person wants to talk about it or they've got maybe a concern, you know, let them talk. Because a great interview really is, it would be you listening. You know, what what they say is a great interviewer is only talking 20% of the time. So, you know, think about I I just noticed that. I just noticed that on your notes and I was laughing to myself of thinking that, that that must have been my interview with you because we can never normally shut you up so I'm sure I'm sure I'm sure your interview was was me doing a, me doing only uh, only 20 percent of the talking <laughs> yeah well listen you you've done that successfully then haven't you <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you don't do too bad talking yourself though do you <laughs> so, 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 so tell me I mean because again I always hear the typical business type question is you know what's your favorite interview questions or you know this is a particular question I you know I I always like to ask people at interview. I mean, are are there good questions to ask, you know, waiting for good answers? Or is it less scientific and more artistic, you know, just in in terms of, Mm. you know, rapport and reading the room? Uh, Yeah, so I think you can be an interviewer with the same questions as another person and you can get totally different results. I think we find out that interviewees do best with a natural relationship. So before you start the interview, let's do that warm-up with people, you know, make them feel at ease, make them feel like they want to talk with you. And loads of open questions that suit the type of interview you're doing, which is really hard because, the, you know, there's now there's so many different forms. You can have face-to-face interviews, video, Zoom interviews, interviews, telephone interviews, some people just get tests or technical interviews, or if you're in an interview are these, assessment Are these work-related centre, open questions or just op- open questions in general? Well, I think starting to build a relationship, you know, it's a case of how are you, how was your journey here? If you start asking questions, did you have a good journey? Yeah, no. It, you know, that's it, the conversation stopped. 
lots of hay. Lots of your hiring for someone in IT. <laughs> maybe, maybe. But have they not just had the opportunity of a great interview with lots of open questions and, you know, great questions looks like how have you found the job that you're in, you know, and asking them to be descriptive. You can say, tell me about your greatest success in your job. And that really helps you to establish things like, right, what are they define as success? Have they took any learnings from that? Was the success a, a failure? But it was a success because it brought them so many learnings. There's lots of things you can find out about a person and their personality by the type of questions and how you want to listen to them, isn't there? I always prefer the, you know, what's your biggest failure or what are you not mm. very good at? You know, I, I always think you get a you get a more uh, interesting reading on someone from that. But uh, yeah. I guess you need to do both. Tell me, I mean, obviously you're saying that it's 80% listening, but at what point do you tell them about the business and the role? I mean, is that kind of when they first walk in the room or when they first jump on the Zoom to say, look, you know, this is what we are as a business or this is what we are as a group of companies and this is what this particular role is. I mean, do we do that at the beginning? So then if they can then turn around and say, actually, this is a total mistake, I should not have come to this interview and they can run off and, and you don't have to waste any time or do you, do you let yeah. them in the rapport building and then you tell them about the role before you get deep onto the nitty gritty questions well i think there's some good answers to that because actually you know i think it's really beneficial to put that quick call in with people beforehand i think to get the best quality interview you save it for the good stuff you save the interview for the good stuff so what i would do is i would do, pick up a 10 15 minute phone call with them prior to actually getting through to the interview phase and just ask them about their um, you know, basic things like where do they live, do they know it's an office-based role, and tell them a bit about the group. And I think what's really valuable as well, we have a job description that we can email out and on the bottom, the hyperlinks of it to tell you all about different companies within the group. And at that stage, they've got a bit more information. You know, we've got things on like the benefits, the holidays, um, the employee discounts, and they can get a really good picture to think, actually, this isn't the type of group I'm after or wow I'm loving what I'm reading I'm going to be really enthusiastic and we spend the interview talking about the good stuff then not sort of burning time telling them about the seven weeks holiday and they're going to start discount because that's a little bit humdrum that's not going to really add value to the business or get to know that person that's just a bit like instruction manual isn't it I think that that conversation beforehand I'd recommend any business to do that. And yeah, you do get a feel for the person. Of course you do. But, you know, as long as you're fair and apply the same set of measures across the board to people, you know you're doing it the right way. You're being fair and equitable. How long should an interview be? And I guess my second question that would be, if you just know, and I'm like, you, you might tell me, well, you just shouldn't know. But like, I mean, I know in 30 seconds if I like someone or not. Right? I mean, if you just know <laughs> they're not for you, should you just save everyone's time and can it after five minutes or you, you going through the motions to be polite so i think there's a couple of answers to that unless somebody has been miles off you know if you're asking for a qualified accountant and you soon discover and they tell you that they aren't but you really need a qualified accountant for that role you know you need to be up front and say actually the qualifications for this role you haven't got them so i'm going to have to bring an interview to close but don't forget that person has took their time to apply and show the interest in the company so we should be gracious because they might not have the skills at that moment in time but you know what they may go away and in a year we've built up that relationship that they want to do that and they want to come back to us and sometimes that's just what life is about you're not going to get that one person from one interview you've got to build networks up relations up only last week I contacted somebody on LinkedIn about one of our great positions that we do have and they said they weren't interested but they actually sent me the name of somebody who was so just by taking that short bit of time out it's got me another lead and another phone call and who knows how that might transpire but as an interviewer you're the brand ambassador and you know you want people to have a good experience how many times would you be interviewing someone before accepting a position or before offering them a position or would that depend on Ooh. 
25 gram roll or a 250 gram roll? Sometimes. I think sometimes the elements are if there's technical skills. So you're doing a preliminary interview, a main interview. And I think what's essential is that you make sure their line manager is absolutely involved in that experience. So it may be a two interview, a three interview. You know, let's not interview for interview's sake. It should have a purpose. But I would say certainly a chat, a main interview interview a further interview you know that line manager must be involved if the line manager isn't involved I've seen many line managers who think they can just tap on the door to HR and have a ready trained person here we go there's your next one and if they're not involved in the process they're not building the relationship up which any part of what we're trying to achieve as a business is line managers to take accountability to drive great performance and to really be able to follow the whole performance performance spine which is taking ownership of the team and driving the performance to be the best it can possibly be and if they don't take an interest in that person or involved in the interview process and being able to select their team you know they probably have got a bit of a disconnect so interviewing is really really important for that point isn't it I know in a, in a smaller business you know I guess realistically they're not going to have an H, HR department you're probably not even have an HR person and mm and the interviewing will probably be done by the business owner and you know, maybe there'll be you know someone to second the opinion them but as yeah. as the business starts to grow at what point are you as hr not involved in the interviews i guess by that what i'm saying is i mean presumably it's not efficient for you to sit in every interview you know and, and it's just efficient or not it's just there's just not going to be enough hours in the day so if i don't know let's say our head of media team if they're looking for an underling in there at what point would he do the interview or, or you know, would you and him be doing it together or would the you know could he start if mm. he's got the capability to do an interview would he do it first and then get you to second it you know i mean uh, where, where, where i think yeah i think that's really interesting because a lot of people see the role of hr as oh, somebody just to ring people up and hire and do that but the true value of hr is being able to get the the team of line managers or the department heads so maybe the head of fashion, the head of digital media, and give them the skills to empower them and grow their skill sets so they can run their business on a mini basis. So they've got enough skills to be able to manage that recruitment process. They've got enough skills to be able to do it fairly. And that's what HR function is, to be able to give the training out, to give that personalised, I suppose, group of skills and determine which each person needs in order to fulfil their role. So a lot of managers need hand-holding, coaching, and and that's absolutely great. Some feel very experienced that they can do it alone. And it's a judgment thing. It's a total individual point. If somebody absolutely doesn't feel competent to do them, they shouldn't be put in that position till they feel ready until they've had enough coaching to do that. So the interesting thing is with the smaller businesses, where they don't have any sort of HR presence or inexperienced people who sometimes don't do a great job at interviews and they're left languishing with quite a vacancy for a very long time, sometimes a year. But I think what you've got to do when you interview is you've got to be that salesperson. The whole world is about selling, isn't it? So I will, when I interview, I will tell them the benefits and we have some people that come and they want to go and work for a massive corporation the thing. And when I speak to people to understand why it's important to really listen to their point of view and I actually spoke to somebody a couple of weeks ago when I was interviewing and they wanted to go and work for a big company and uh, they thought that would get them promoted quicker and I said you might be right I said do bear in mind the bigger companies will pigeonhole you they'll want you to fill that role tick that box and you'll be just stuck doing that but on the plus side there's probably more chance of of different jobs coming up and the opportunity to grow. The beauty with a small or medium business is you are exposed to a lot of different jobs to do. So almost you're doing a smaller amount
amount, but gathering so much vast experience. And I think it's important to sell that. And, you know, it's certainly something that, that you know, I, I talk about with people thinking if anybody's particularly ambitious, I talk about the different facets, you know, the opportunity to grow, to be able to move in. And, you know, certainly from our point of view, we build a structure with different levels, which if you're new to our business and you're starting on level one, you can move up to level two, three, four, just how we've set it up and we'll help you to do that. We'll support with your learning and we'll pay for your learning as well. So I think there's many, many good things that you've got to make sure your line managers are going to chuck into that interview so that the it looks an appealing prospect. So are you sure your managers can actually do that? Well, it takes a lot of time and a lot of practice. I mean, I'm not many really sure how many tens of thousands of interviews I've done in my life. Some have worked out well, some I probably haven't done very well. You know, sometimes there's been some people who I just haven't been able to connect with. And for that reason, maybe I didn't get the best out of them and they didn't have the best experience. So, you know, sometimes you've got to think of what the blockers are. Have you connected with them? Is it a generation thing and you haven't quite found out their motivation spot? Or is it just actually the the haven't got the skill set for the job there's lots of things to work through I mean when we talk about skill sets I guess on certain jobs you can be getting them to do a test getting them to do a, do a trial run I mean how how much I mean is there a right answer is it just how much you can get away with but you know I mean how, how much is acceptable to actually get someone to do and I mean I, I remember this myself in the context of we were recruiting a copywriter it was a bit before your time and you know we were asking them to do a an X, X number of hundred word piece about a particular topic and I remember one person in particular basically came back and said look I'm not going to do it or I've done 500 words I'm not going to write 1500 words because this is just a test and I'm not I'm not going to spend my time in it if I'm not getting the job now I mean rightly or wrongly I immediately discarded that person I'm thinking well if you're not prepared you're not prepared to put the effort in you know okay you're doing it on spec you're doing it unpaid but you know you've got to put some some effort and risk into the job and okay they might argue that they've sent me their portfolio of work but their portfolio of work doesn't directly translate to the specific kind of copy I want and I think I'm within my if I'm about to pay someone 35 40 50 grand I think I'm within my rights to actually know, actually know I mean even writing one piece of copy isn't a lot really you know I mean I, I, I would have liked I would never have asked for it because it's not not realistic or practical but I'd have liked four five six pieces of copy because you know they could have had a good day a bad day or whatever but I mean what's acceptable for, for how much you can test people well I think that's absolutely reasonable because if they're not willing to put that work in the don't align with the values that you have and our group values so actually it's a perfect way to sort out it's another element that you can use to choose who is the right fit for your organization and it's for the interviewee to decide actually that business isn't a good fit for me because I want to come and sort of do the bare minimum so I think it's really effective you know the group is so diverse you know if we were interviewing for some somebody in one of the retail clothing store, let them go in there and do a few hours in the shift, as a shift. You know, they can go in there, they can see how they gel with the team and see what the business is about. Then we can assess, you know, are they a great salesperson? Have they got customer service at the number one part? Likewise, you know, let people see the work environment where they're going to be working. Particularly, will they fit in the team? Do they feel comfortable to do the best work there? So by no means can we say to people, actually, come and work a month for me while we decide but I think the task is absolutely reasonable and it gives them a bit of an idea of what the job is about what sort of standard that we're looking for and it gives them a chance to showcase their best work and it helps us find are they a fit for us and are we the right fit for them so I think it's perfect you know you wouldn't hire I don't know we, we not that this is relevant but you wouldn't hire a carpenter without asking them for to look it is at her work would you so it's absolutely no different but a lot of businesses do a lot of businesses just take it from a CV quick interview and that's it they're in and it's a real 50-50 then if they work out a lot of businesses don't put enough 
effort because it is it is hard work is interviewing and recruiting and getting that right person i don't know if this question is relevant to interviewing or if it would probably come at a different stage of the game but how important is referencing and again i'm you know it's almost like a leading question from me as you know yourself <laughs> i personally never really bother with referencing because i just think who is going to give a bad reference or rather i don't mean yeah. who's going to write a bad reference i mean who is going to put on their cv a referee who is going to give them a bad reference i mean i mean exactly. maybe that Maybe that is a test to, to, to find out how, how moronic they actually are. But, I mean, should you be taking references or is that just ticking a box? Some people ask for the references and they don't do anything with them. Well, that is ticking a box. However, you know, like, say for well, instance, that's the other many... thing. I mean, I mean, nowadays, most companies don't even want to write a reference, do they? they prepare, they'll say, yes. I'm prepared to accept, to acknowledge that Kelly worked for us in the role of HR from whatever, the 1st of Jan. Yeah, you know, to the 1st yeah. Of that's what that... That is a lot of just what you get. But, you know, sometimes we can do other things depending on the role. So some of our roles are dealing with, you know, very, very confidential information. So to do a full background check, a CCJ check, a, you know, criminal and credit reference check, they are valuable because if they're in charge of pots of money, a lot of people, especially investors, want to know that we've done our due diligence and we haven't just took the next Ronnie Biggs on. So sometimes surprises like that do surface sometimes we can contact the previous employers and this person has told us how fantastic they are but unfortunately they may have been dismissed so why would we want them in our business if that's the case if it was for poor performance or if they were dismissed for absence or you know poor behavior any of that type of thing so it is an option it, it very much depends on the type of job you do and it's entirely up to the organization but you are right in what say a lot of businesses they don't want that liability or accountability so they will only confirm the dates that that person's worked so yeah it is a choice it is a choice well you've made some very pretty notes for this which will stick up on the podcast as um as some show notes as well that a little pdf that people can download with all these goodies so thank you very much as always kelly before you go putting you on the spot here but i'm sure you've got plenty tell me your most horrendous or embarrassing or funny interview story oh my gosh i don't know if i'm legally allowed to. <laughs> we can take out the names yeah so i remember interviewing i'm chatting with this guy and it was actually interviewing it was a store launch very local to here and we were wanting some managerial presence and it was a petrol station in particular and there's some gaps in this guy's cv started probing thinking oh where's he been for these couple of years to just miss something off and I asked where he was and he'd been at his ma uh, Her Majesty's pleasure for a couple of years and I, I just happened to say all right well um, okay rehabilitation under the Offenders Act do you feel comfortable in telling me you know why you got sent to prison I said yes yeah. actually I uh, was involved in an armed robbery I, I went oh right this is on a petrol station what do you do there <laughs> there, there are so many and what, and what did what did you do? Did did you bring the interview to an end because you presumably weren't going to hire him, or did you have to let it play um, out? Listen, uh, it was good enough to apply and show interest into the business. I just didn't feel it would be a right fit. Um, you know, it was a <laughs> it was a isolated role. You were pretty much out there on your own. And yeah, we we had a more experienced people for the role, somebody who'd done it before, and they were truly, truly the best fit. And but, they didn't carry yeah. a gun. And they didn't carry a gun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen. Yeah, on that I'm, note. We're, on that note, we're going to wrap it up. Guys, I hope you enjoyed listening to that, what's been episode three of the HR Zone, all about interviewing. As I said, there'll be some, um, there'll be a little PDF, put some notes in the show notes, and we will see you again next week with whatever Kelly's got to teach us in episode four. We're finding our feet with this format, just as I'm finding my feet with HR in general. So if you've got any comments, questions, feedback, always want to hear it. And if you've enjoyed listening to this podcast, you can find my other podcast, Matt Haycock's Daily and the Matt Haycock Show in all the usual places so until next time thank you very much thank you bye